Sydney, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, January 19, and here are some of the stories we are covering. The DRC government accuses Rwanda of supporting the M23 rebels and threatens war if nothing is done about it. The M23, everybody knows, is backed by Rwanda because Rwanda is still looking to seize some territories that has a lot of minerals on it. Malawi's president fires his chief prosecutor for abuse of office. A new study finds Somalis are highly traumatized by political instability and prolonged violence. UNESCO says the killings of journalists and media workers jumped 50% in 2022. Gambia mourns its vice president who passed away Wednesday at age 65. The president, in honor of the former vice president, Badara Ali Diouf, has declared a seven-day national mourning with all Gambian flags and all flags in the country flying at half staff, like they say, in the United States. And Pope Francis prepares for long-awaited visit to Congo and South Sudan. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. A spokesperson for Democratic Republic of Congo, President Felix Tshisekedi, has reiterated the president's comments earlier this week that peace in eastern Congo rests with Rwanda because Kigali supports the M23 rebels operating in eastern Congo. President Tshisekedi, speaking at the World Economic Forum this week in Switzerland, accused the M23 of reneging on its promise to withdraw from areas it captured in eastern Congo. There was a protest yesterday, Wednesday, in Goa calling for enforcement of the group's promised retreat. Presidential spokesman Ibrahim Luaka Buanga says that Rwanda continues to support the M23 because it wants to seize parts of DRC that are rich in minerals. He denies Rwanda's claims that Kinshasa supports the rebel democratic forces for the liberation of Rwanda, the FDLR, also operating in eastern Congo. Luaka Buanga tells me that if Rwanda continues to support the rebels, DRC will have no other choice but to go to war. This to explain to you that the M23, everybody knows, is backed by Rwanda. And since Rwanda doesn't want to play it safely, to work in terms of bringing the peace in the Great Lakes region, I'm not seeing the withdrawal of the M23. It's been years that Rwanda is trying to seize some land in the DRC. And everybody knows we have lost almost like 10 to 12 million Congolese. And nobody says a word about it because Rwanda is still looking to seize some territories that have a lot of minerals on it. We, as a Congolese, brought enough proof to the international community and today even the U.S., the AU, or many countries out there are today complaining, asking Rwanda to stop backing the M23. So, since M23, they don't want to leave the Congo. This is Rwanda. I don't want to leave in the Congo. Abraham, let me ask you, uh, Rwanda also accuses your government of supporting the FDLR. Do you support them? The question is, how many FDLR remain in the DRC? There is no proof. We have evidence that M23 is rather armed. Drone images and the videos about, we show that to the AU, to the, the UN uh, Security Council. They do have all the proof, like I told you. But we need today, rather to bring proof saying that Congo is backing FDLR. There is no FDLR in the Congo, believe me. Because if the FDLR was, was out there, my question is, why Rwanda cannot organize a peace summit and call to those Suppose FDLR to get back into their country so they can sit down around the table and find a solution. Why they keep on saying that we are backing FDLR, but we've said enough is enough. We brought enough proof to the international community, and we, we've been asking the condemnation of Rwanda for what is taking place in the Congo. We went into Nairobi uh, talks, Luanda talks. We signed an agreement, and M23 and the Rwanda was out there, represented by their own ambassador, one time by their own foreign affairs minister. But why today 
and Ventura is not leaving the position that they've, they've taken. That's the main question. And since we know that M23 is Rwanda, the question is, why Rwanda doesn't want to leave the Congo? I gave it to you. The answer is because they know the land is full of minerals and they want to stay out there. But this is going to send the Congo to take another position. And why not to call for a war? What about the treatment of refugees? You know, Congo is it's a huge land. We have tried and we keep on trying to help our brothers and sisters to bring to them, you know, uh, food, bringing them, you know, lodging, expecting that M23 will leave and all those people can get back to their own homes. But actually, it's not the case. And this is a tragedy, tragedy brought in the Congo by Rwanda. Abraham Luakabuanga is the spokesperson for DRC President Felix Chisekedi. You are speaking with me from the capital, Kinshasa. The people of the Gambia are mourning the death of their vice president, Bardara Aliu Juf, who passed away Wednesday in India at the age of 65. President Adam Ambaro has described the late Juf as a competent, patriotic, and honest Gambian. Government spokesperson Ibrahim Maksankare tells me President Baro has declared a seven-day national mourning beginning yesterday, Wednesday. The vice president has uh, fallen ill some uh, few weeks ago. He was actually admitted at a local hospital briefly, and thereafter he was ferried to India for overseas treatment. And unfortunately, after recovering well, he had actually planned to return this coming Saturday. Uh, early this morning, we got the devastating news that uh, he has expired. Tell us about the day of mourning. Yeah, the president, in honor of the former vice president, uh, Badr Ali Diouf, has declared a seven-day national mourning with all Gambian flags and all flags in the country flying at half staff, like they say in the United States, and half mast in the British-speaking world, that is. He actually was very close to the president. The president had always seen him as a big brother. He was a teacher to most of us, myself inclusive, several of the ministers in the cabinet were his students, either in high school or at college. Like the announcement stated, the obituary, from the presidency describes uh, the former vice president as a scholar of profound intellect. He was a very impressive guy, very intelligent, very down to earth person, very unassuming. He brought to bear a lot of experience, knowledge, and expertise. And this was why, soon after President Barrow won the elections, he actually sought his uh, help to relinquish a very prestigious job as director at the World Bank in Africa to come actually and help in fixing the newly found democracy in the Gambia. So it's his death, really, the sadness, not only to President Barrow and the family and the government, but to the entire nation, and in fact, across Africa. So the sad event occurred in India, is that correct? And uh, when do you expect the body of the late vice president to arrive in the Gambia? Yes, he died early morning, Gambian time, but in India it was 12.41 p.m., So his body is expected to arrive in the Gambia no later than Sunday. Knowing what international travel is with regard to dead bodies and all the diplomatic retinue that that comes with the death of a vice president, we are expecting that the body would arrive in the Gambia hopefully by Saturday no later than Sunday. And the body would uh, be laid in state at the National Assembly for a state funeral befitting his office and his work for the Gambian people. So Gambia is uh, talking now about presidential election. Tell me, wh- what will be the impact of uh, this sad news? I mean, how are vice presidents, are they elected or appointed? No, no, no. Actually, the elections that are looming are not the presidential election. They are the parliamentary and local government elections. And that was going to be in April, somewhere in April, May, I, I think, or, or thereabout. Vice presidents in the Gambia are not elected. It's not like the presidential system in America where you have a running mate. The vice president is actually appointed from a pool of uh, competent Gambians that the president deems fit to serve as his vice president. Thank you so much, my brother. It's so nice to talk with you. And please, once again, accept our condolences for the passing of your vice president. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. Ibrahim Asankare is the Gambian government spokesperson. He was speaking with me from the capital, Banjul.
Malawi's president, Lastro Chakwera, has fired the country's director of public prosecution, Stephen Kayune, for allegedly abusing his office to avenge what the president saw as a personal slight. Kayune had the country's anti-corruption chief arrested last month after the chief said officials were interfering with her investigations. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre. Malawian President Lazarus Chakwera announced the dismissal of Director of Public Prosecution Stephen Kayuni during a televised national address Wednesday. Chakwera was reacting to the findings of a commission of inquiry he established last month to find out the circumstances that led to the arrest of the country's anti-corruption chief, Martha Jizuma. The commission of inquiry found that police arrested Chizuma a few days after Kayuni complained to police that he felt criminally injured by statements Chizuma made in January 2022. In the audio that was later leaked to social media, Chizuma said that high-ranking officials, including lawyers, judges, and government authorities, were hindering her fight against corruption. Chizuma was arrested on December 6th but detained for only a few hours following calls from other officials, ordinary Malawians, and the British and U.S. embassies for her release. The report from the Commission of Inquiry said Kayuni was wrong to file a personal complaint on matters pertaining to his office as Director of Public Prosecutions. The Commission asked President Chakwera to take appropriate action against Kayuni. As such, to prevent him from using a public office to settle a personal injury, I have removed Dr. Kayuni from office with immediate effect, and I thank him for his many years of service. Chakwela announced that has appointed Masaoko Edwin Chankakara as Malau's new director of public prosecutions, and he called on all government agencies to support the new government's chief prosecutor. Chakwera rejected the recommendation from the Commission of Inquiry that he should take some action against Chizuma for offenses she may have committed in her leaked audio. Chakwera said he already forgave Chizuma last year when some people wanted her fired. So I want to make this clear today. I stand by my decision not to fire Ms. Chizuma a year ago, and I stand by my choice of her as my champion against corruption today. However, Chakwera called for disciplinary action against two deputy police inspector generals, Haben Kandawire and Kaspar Jalera, for insubordination. The two police chiefs are accused of rejecting Chakwera's directive to release Chizuma unconditionally when she was arrested on December 6. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, January 19. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. A new health study finds that people in Somalia are highly traumatized by political instability, prolonged violence, and humanitarian crisis. The joint study by the United Nations, Somalia's health ministry, and the country's national university found that mental disorders are prevalent across the country. It says cases are about 77% higher than a previous study by the World Health Organization, which suggested that nearly 40% of the population in Somalia had an emotional or psychological disorder. Reporter Haroon Maruf of the U.S. Somali Service spoke to Dr. Mamunur Rahman Malik, Somalia country representative for the WHO. What the study finding is telling us, number one, the study findings confirm that Somali population are highly traumatized given the long history of political instability and continued violence. And this has been also confirmed by the qualitative interviews and information that we collected from this study. Now, surprisingly, what we have seen 
there is a high prevalence and wide range of various mental disorders and substance abuse in the young population. The prevalence was quite high, over 76%, and the lifetime substance abuse disorder in the population, what we found out through this study, is also quite high, 53%. And most importantly, the perceived quality of life amongst these young people is, is very surprising to us. And what concerns you most regarding the findings of this study? What's the most worrying finding? The worrying finding is that globally, we know that the most prevalent mental health disorder is depression or anxiety. But what we have seen in this study, that the common mental health illness amongst this population is panic disorder and post-traumatic disorder. So panic disorder, 39%, and post-traumatic disorder, 37%. And this is amongst the young age group. Now, we know that if we leave these conditions untreated, this may lead to suicidal tendency. And in previous estimates, we have seen the suicidal rate amongst young population in Somalia is one of the highest in the world. 14 to 15 part of 100,000 population. And similar to these estimates, our study has found out that the risk of committing suicide amongst these young people was 22% in the population that were studied. Now, the other worrying factor for me is a high degree of and prevalence of substance abuse among young population. For example, the lifetime use of tobacco was 38%, sedatives 37%. And the use of narcotic drugs like amphetamine was 21%. And now these are not regulated in this country, you know that. Somalia is the only country which has not ratified the WHO's Global Convention on Tobacco Control. Now this is something the country has to ratify. That was Dr. Mamunu Rakhmet Malik, Somalia country representative for the World Health Organization. You are speaking with Harun Maruf of VOS Somali Service. A report released this week by the UN cultural body, UNESCO, finds that killings of journalists and media workers jumped 50% in 2022 to a total of 86 worldwide, or about one death every four days. UNESCO Director General Audrey Azule called the new numbers alarming and urged authorities to ramp up efforts to stop such crimes and bring the perpetrators to justice. The largest number of fatal attacks in 2021 occurred in Asia, with 42% of the killings, followed by Latin America and the Caribbean, with 25%. The third deadliest region was Africa, with 18% of killings. Guillaume Canela is the head of UNESCO's Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalist Section. He tells viewers Carol Van Damme the increase follows three years of fewer killings of journalists. In the last uh, four years, at least prior to 2022, we were witnessing uh, a good trend of downsizing the numbers of killings, uh, which does not mean that we had less attacks against the press. But obviously, the most cruel way of attacking the press and of censoring freedom of expression is uh, the killings. No, uh, so. Prior to 2022, we were observing a trend of reduce, reducing the numbers of killings, although we were also monitoring a raise in other kinds of problems. Uh, but last year, we witnessed it again, unfortunately, the increase was of 50 percent. What do you attribute uh, that to? I mean, we know about the Russian invasion in Ukraine, and but most of these numbers, are, from what I read, are coming in Latin America. Yes, unfortunately, still most of the journalists killed are journalists that are not involved in the coverage of conflicts or wars. They are journalists involved in, in the coverage of the daily life, corruption, uh, organized crime and uh, human rights violations, environmental violations, and, and so on and so forth. We had, of course, uh, at least 11 killings uh, condemned by the director general uh, in the war uh, in Ukraine. But uh, this is not enough to explain the 50 percent increase. Uh, but there are some hypotheses. Uh, one of them, of course, is the two previous years 
years uh, during the pandemic, the journalists, several journalists worldwide were also in lockdown, so not necessarily exposing themselves uh, in these dangerous environments in, in the coverage of organized crime. They were doing that from home. There is also another hypo- hypothesis in terms of uh, an increasing hostility against freedom of expression in general, but press freedom in particular, a kind of a narrative from different important leaders, not only political leaders, but sometimes religious leaders, a narrative that's a narrative against journalism. There seems to be like what you're pointing to is a coarsening of societal attitudes toward journalists and how you know the violence is just becoming more common. Yes, when we say that, uh, that the policies to tackle these issues, we say that they should be comprehensive policies, and we call them the policies of the three Ps, prevention, protection, and prosecution of the crimes. And why I mention that? Because this tells a little bit the story here. If there is not a, a understanding that press freedom is an individual but also a collective right, then we have a problem for this overall prevention perspective of the journalism as an important profession for protecting democracies and human rights. So when a journalist is killed uh, in a particular uh, city, is of course the freedom of expression of that journalist that is being censored in the most cruel way, but is the freedom of expression of that entire community. That was Guillaume Canela, the head of the Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists section at UNESCO. We are speaking to my colleague Carol Van Damme from the group's headquarters in Paris. Pope Francis is set to travel to the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan at the end of this month, a visit the pontiff had earlier been forced to postpone due to health issues. Sabina Castofranco reports from Rome. Pope Francis visits the Democratic Republic of Congo from January 31st to February 3rd and then will spend two days in South Sudan before returning to the Vatican. When the Holy See announced the trip, which was called off due to the Pope's kneel ailments last summer, it said the Archbishop of Canterbury and the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland would be travelling with the Pope to the two African countries. The Pope will first travel to Kinshasa, where he will meet with the country's authorities, victims of the conflict in the eastern part of the country and representatives of charitable organisations. Then he will fly to Juba, the capital of South Sudan, on February 3rd. Kinshasa, a large and impoverished city of more than 10 million people, is getting a facelift ahead of the papal visit. The apostolic nuncio in the DRC, Ettore Balestrero, said a huge effort is being made to ensure security and public order while the Pope is in the country. It is the first time a Pope travels to the country in 37 years, and Balestrero said that for many people, Pope Francis's arrival is, in his words, a dream come true. In an interview with Vatican News, the Archbishop said that the main purpose of the visit to the DRC is to awaken faith in those who do not have it and to strengthen the joy of those who do. He added that throughout the country there is an anticipation of receiving a word of consolation and also of healing of the wounds that are still bleeding, especially in the East. On Tuesday, Pope Francis sent his condolences to victims of a bombing of a Pentecostal church in Kazindi in North Kivu province in eastern Congo. Islamic militants claimed responsibility for the attack that killed at least 14 people and injured more than 60. The Pope was originally planning to visit Goma in the north, but this violence continues to ravage parts of the province. The stop was scrapped. Pope Francis has long desired to travel to predominantly Christian South Sudan, but the unstable situation in the country had complicated plans for a visit. A peace deal was signed in the country in 2018, putting an end to a five-year civil war which killed 400,000 people. But the nation is still reeling from hunger and violence. Speaking at the end of the Sunday Angelus prayers in St. Peter's Square in December, the Pope made one more appeal for an end to the violence in South Sudan and asked for prayers for reconciliation. 
Pope Francis expressed concern at the news of violent clashes in South Sudan and prayed for peace and national reconciliation and an end to the attacks. Sabina Castelfranco for VOA News, Rome. And that's it for this Thursday, January 19th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for being our guest this morning. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa team, I am James Barton in Washington saying, have a great day.